Come and fill this place. Spirit, come and fill this place. Let your glory now and Spirit, come and fill this place. Let your glory Thank you, Lord. God, we do ask that your spirit would fall on us afresh, God. We can come to you again and again asking to be filled and renewed. For this is who you are and this is what you do. You make us new, God. This road with every step we take, your faithfulness is our portion. And you prepared a city bright and fair, whose gates forever stay open. The Son of God in you we take. joy to share in your
things made right and new again. Oh, Lord, our God, your goodness is free and endless, is reaching endless through it all. Just as you promised, God, your Son was One soul in weakness, you raise and promise your beauty arches and You know, this isn't just a song to sing at Easter. Jesus is risen and Jesus is coming again. And every tear will be wiped away. Every loss will be made new. And we will have hope. We have access to hope today. Thank you, Lord. teach you guys a new song this morning. It's called Adore Him. It is by grace. It is by grace that we are saved. been raised with Jesus Christ. That set our hearts on things above. That we
Lord, we fix our eyes on you. We fix our eyes on you this morning, God. You are our center. You are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, thank you that we can have new beginnings, God. Thank you for renewing us as we come before you each day and we ask, Lord, Lord, help us to take your light and shine it into the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, you guys may be seated. You may have heard uh, in the beginning I was explaining our stage lights did not come on today, so that's why we're improvising. Uh, but at this time, we would love to draw our children close. Um, our youth are already in their mentoring class, um, and so let's um, reach out to our children and say together our children's blessing before we dismiss them, okay? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Okay, parents, um, you may take your kids to their classes. And while we are um, milling about, please turn to a neighbor and say, what have you done for yourself recently or something someone has done for you that's lifted your spirits? My answer is a manicure.
Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here at Access today. My name is Grace Chow, and um, I just want to welcome you. And hopefully you guys have had a good week. If you had any kids going back to school, things like that, it's an exciting time. Um, so I have some announcements for us. First off, we always want to get started by saying if you're new here, we, we want to welcome you and see if you would take some time to fill out a Connect card so that you can get more connected with what we do here at Access and our mission here. And of course, there's that QR code on, um, on the slide. So that's the easiest way to kind of uh, get signed up for that. Um, next, we do have a youth overnighter um, this coming Saturday at 7 p.m. Um, youth can join us for a fun night of games and snacks and sing-alongs. Um, eat dinner before you come and bring your sleeping bag, toothbrush, and clothes for Sunday worship. Snacks and breakfast will be provided, um, and it's going to end at 10 a.m. so uh, that they can join us for Sunday service the following day. All right, and then we do have an on-ramp coming up. So if you're new to Access and you, if you'd like to know more about the spiritual community and how to get involved, the on-ramp class is designed to help you get up to speed and connected with our life together. Uh, so that will be on Sunday, September 10th from 11.30 to 1. Lunch is included, uh, but you do need to reserve your spot so that we can order for you. So if you're interested in attending, email tedlaw at accesslive.org. We are looking for a few volunteers to, volu uh, to be willing to be trained to help out on Sunday mornings with our AV booth. Training is available to learn how to run slides, sound, or the camera um, for our live stream. And the commitment would be once a month. So please email Jessica uh, at audio at accesslive.org or there's that cool QR code with a thumbs up and you can just scan and it'll automatically take you to an email um, to let them know that you're interested. Leave it to the AV team to have some people like that. <laughs> oh, Adrian. All right, and then um, next, save the date. Access is going on a short-term trip to the Rio Grande Valley to get a better understanding of the modern immigration journey. Uh, we're partnering with our denomination, the ECC, to learn, serve, and love as Christ would love. Uh, the trip will be February 16th to 19th. I do believe that the kids also have the day off um, that Monday, so if they are interested in going, um, you, they can join. Email AMA at accesslive.org if you're interested, and there's going to be more details to come. All right, and so now I'd like to invite Cindy and Adrian to come up to talk about our retreat. All right, thanks so much, Grace. Uh, I'm Cindy, this is Adrian, and we uh, really hope that you will, uh, <laughs> uh, there we go. Oh, um, we really hope that you'll join us at our fall retreat, um, which will be September 22nd and 23rd, Friday and Saturday. Um, it's going to be here in our Stebbins building, and so everybody can go home to sleep, which will be wonderful. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll be well rested. Um, this is going to be our first retreat since 2019, and so it's going to be the first opportunity um, since COVID to really build our spiritual connection within our community uh, through a weekend-long experience. Um, the theme of our retreat is Healing Presence. Um, God has been impressing the theme of healing on our hearts this year as we've been walking through some very challenging seasons as a community. Um, and so we really hope that you'll join us at the retreat um, to make time for God um, as he can meet us in our physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. Um, it'll also be an opportunity to walk together um, towards God's healing presence um, as we connect with God, ourselves, and each other. Um, so the next question is what will happen at retreat, and uh, this is the retreat agenda. It is available on the website um, linked, um, and as you can see, um, uh, there will be four meals and four sessions where there will be um, listening groups and worship and teaching and solitude, uh, times of reflection. 
Um, and just to tell you a little bit more about the listening groups, what are they? They are groups of four to five people um, that we'll meet consistently with throughout the retreat. So you'll have the same group throughout the retreat. Um, and you can choose uh, during registration a mixed gender group or a same gender group, or you can also choose no preference, and then you'll have a surprise. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so there will also be a lot of opportunities during free time and meals where we can you know, just hang out and enjoy one another's company. Um, during those meals and free times, um, we'll all be together with the kids and the youth. Um, and during the other times, there will be programming available for the kids and the youth. I think the youth might also go out to lunch one time, so they might be not be available to hang out with us uh, during one of the sessions or during one of the meals. Um, but that's all I have for you. And now Adrian will tell us a little bit more. Yes, so uh, when you go to the registration page, it will look like this. Registration is a flat fee of $30 per adult and $10 per youth and child, which covers program, child care, and meals. What a great deal. You can request scholarships and also provide scholarships before payment. Looking for the retreat agenda, just click on the link that says Access 2023 Retreat Information, which also contains the youth permission form. Next slide. Here you can use the adult you can see the adult registration. This is where you can select your preference for a breakout listening group, mixed gender, same gender, or no preference for a surprise. You can also let us know about the sessions you plan to attend. You'll get the most out of the retreat if you attend all sessions, but we know this might not be possible for everyone. This is the kids and youth um, registration page. Workers from First Baptist Church will provide kids programming and Josh Yip will lead the youth. On this page, you can volunteer. Let us know if you can help us out with the retreat. We would love to have your help and ideas, especially with free time activities. At this point in the registration, you can also request a scholarship or provide a scholarship. And finally, you can choose to pay by credit card or you can place your payment in the offering box on the wall at the back um, if you would like to pay by cash or check. So, Register today. We will be in the lobby after service, and we would love to answer any questions. We'll also have um, cherries and donut holes. So please come see us at the table and register today. And just so you know, everyone said last week that the cherries were amazing. <laughs> and now we will have Pastor Grace come up to deliver our message for today. some music. Oops. Turn that frown upside down. Turn that frown upside down. This is the theme of a beloved best-selling children's book called Pout Pout Fish. It describes this Pout Pout Fish that spreads his dreary wearies all over the place, being judged and rejected by his fellow ocean friends. They ask him, why can't you just be happy? Why can't you just have a bit of joy and a bit of hope? And then he swims away, or, or they swim away, and essentially they're communicating to him that he's not so fun to be around unless he has that frown and turns it upside down. The story communicates and represents so much of what is viewed as societal norms 
and how we ought to interact as we are in community and relationship with each other. It's written for children, teaching them this is how we should socialize. To feel accepted, to feel a sense of belonging, we need to turn that frown upside down. There's no room for dreary wearies. We only welcome those who are fun, who are cheerful, who are joyful and smiley. But as we are learning in this series with all our hearts, we were created not only to be happy and joyful, but God created us to experience every emotion, not hide them in order to feel this sense of belonging and acceptance And so if God created us as humans to experience these emotions, we can believe that as image bearers, that as image bearers of God, that our emotions are part of the Imago Dei. We can believe that our emotions are supremely important to God. That so many of our emotions, they're actually godly, And they're actually spiritual. And this includes the ones that are so uncomfortable to face privately and publicly. This morning, we are going to define grief. We're going to look at these emotions of grief and loss. And we're going to talk about all the various forms of grief. And we're going to look at a passage in John chapter 11 where Jesus shows us what that process of grief looks like. He models this for us. And then we're going to look at some practical ways that we can begin to move through the process of grief and loss. Will you join me in praying? Thank you, Lord, that you created us in your image and that you see us so lovingly and tenderly with compassion that every tear matters to you that you're just not wanting just this joyful praise from us but you're wanting to be present with us even in our darkest moments our saddest moments Lord, as we look at your scripture, your word together as a community, will you help us to know you more and know your heart more for each one of us? Speak to us. Help us to feel you and help us to feel every emotion that is stirred within us this morning. We pray these things in your name. I want to expand our view of grief, okay? I'm going to go back just a sec, just just a moment. I want to expand our view of grief in a way for some of, in a brand new way for some of us. Now, there's this culturally accepted and expected form of grief, and it's when we lose someone that we love, right? When someone passes away. And we can feel and empathize with this form of loss because we all know that we have lifespans. There's infectious diseases. There are accidents happen. Life's fra- life is fragile. And all of humanity would agree that this is a valid form of grief, that we carve out this time to grieve the loss of a loved one. But there are other forms of grief that I want to take a moment to just name. And this this type of grief, they're, they're enormous, and they can weigh heavily on our heart. But we don't mourn this type of grief publicly, and sometimes we don't even do it privately. It might be a miscarriage, the loss of a job, a betrayal, a pet running away from home never to be found, Unfulfilled dreams, finding out for the first time your parents aren't your biological parents, getting a divorce, infertility, 
a friend moving away, finding out your child has a disability, learning that you can no longer do an activity that you love because of a physical injury or impairment, caring for your aging parents as they are battling mental health issues. And this is what is called disenfranchised grief. These are often privately grieved, if even grieved at all, because they are unacknowledged by societal norms. And because society doesn't recognize these as forms of grief, many don't even move into this process of grief because they've rejected their own grief. They've stuffed it down where healing cannot happen. Disenfranchised grief is oftentimes, it's invisible, it's isolating, and it makes it even harder because it's invisible and isolating to even heal from this grief because maybe we're like, yeah, this, does, it, does it even count as real grief? Does it even count? But it can be just as painful as losing a loved one. So as we look at grief today, let's welcome Let's welcome and recognize all the different forms of grief and loss that we experience. And remember that every form of grief and loss counts and requires healing. Our definition of grief needs to expand and we need to accept and acknowledge various forms of grief even though it might be countercultural. So some things to know about grief, and some of this might be review, but it's important to remember that grieving is not a single act or event. We can't say, oh, I've done my journaling for 15 minutes. I've done my journaling for the week. I've, I'm done with the grieving. It's not just this one-time thing. It's not just, oh, the funeral or whatever, and then, oh, now my grief is over. It just, it's not a single act or event. It's a process that we engage in so that healing can happen. It's a chance for us to make new meaning of what's happened and create this new story so that we can be in a place where we can move forward versus trying to just move on from it. It's not something that we can speed through or fast forward. I don't know about you, but Sometimes when I'm listening to those podcasts and I've got only this amount of time, I'll listen to it at 1.2 or 1.5 speed, right? We have so much of that in, in our control now. I actually, I actually know a medical student who went through medical school watching all the lectures from home at two times the speed, and he's actually a remarkable physician. So maybe you could do that with, like, knowledge that just needs to be received, okay? But grief and loss, you can't speed through it. You can't fast forward it. You can't jump over it, right? And it's nonlinear. So there are going to be days when you're like, I've made progress. I feel better today. Live into that day, but know that that process of grief, that there could be months later, oh, man, I'm feeling again. And that can feel so frustrating because you're like, it's been, it's been five years. It's been eight years, and I'm still not over it. But that's part of the grief process. It's nonlinear. And as frustrating and painful as this might be, this is hard, but it's holy work. That's what I want you all to know this morning. It is holy work because God is present in all of our ups and downs in the process of grief as human beings. He designed us this way, not as a form of punishment, but because he values and sees the benefits of us experiencing these emotions that come with our engagement in grief. Let's take a look at the scripture passage so you know where I'm going with this. John chapter 11. 
Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. We see here that Jesus is super close with this family. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they're all siblings. And when Jesus would visit that town of Bethany, and he would visit this family, and they would show him great hospitality. As you can remember the story of Mary Martha, where Mary sat at Jesus' feet and learned from him, where Martha prepared a meal for them. They had a very special and close relationship with Jesus. And that's why they said, go and, and, find, go and find Jesus and tell him, the one you love is sick. They needed his help. And what we learn in the next several verses is that Jesus knew already that Lazarus was dead. It was already too late. But he had bigger and greater plans. And that was to raise Lazarus from the dead, which is what they all would have wanted to see, right? And experience right away for those tears of mourning to turn into tears of joy, for their pain to stop right away. But when he arrives at Bethany, we learn he doesn't perform that miracle right away. He doesn't come and save and save the day and rescue everyone from their sorrows. I mean, this whole community is coming and they're they're crying. They're coming around Lazarus, who they thought were, were sick. And when he does, he actually, he actually waits a couple of days. Even when he receives word, he waits a couple of days before he actually goes. And when he does arrive, we eventually see Jesus do this remarkable thing. Verse 32, when Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying also, he was deeply disturbed and troubled. He asked, where have you laid him? And they replied, Lord, come and see. And he did. And Jesus began to cry. The Jews said, see how much he loved him? He cries. That's what he does. When he goes there, he cries. He knows the end, and yet he cries. He weeps with them. He joins them in their state of grief, in their state of loss. Verse 33 says, he's deeply disturbed and troubled. He's sensitive to Mary and Martha's grief and, he, and pain. He identifies with it and he sees the fullness of their humanity here. We see the fullness of Jesus' humanity here. Guys, we have a God who identifies with our pain and our heartbreak. And it's not this quiet, silent, meek cry either. The Greek word for cry is klaios, which means this loud wailing, loud wailing and crying, which is unheard of and foreign in our society and culture. But this loud wailing amongst the bereaved and others in the community was common and appropriate for such an occasion. So imagine this picture of Jesus engaging in a ritual where emotions are fully connected, 
fully expressed in the presence of family members and the rest of the community. He didn't just show up to the ritual emotionless because he knew the ending. He showed up and he provided this healing circle, this healing space, this holding space to attend to their grief and loss. And he didn't hold back. He didn't hold back even though he knew what the ending was. Jesus even allowed Mary and Martha to engage fully in their grief, their frustration, and their anger. Two times in this chapter, each one of them asked Jesus, where were you? If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. When we engage in our grief, is, don't we ask these questions? Why did God allow this to happen? What is this world that I live in now that these things happen? Where were you, God, when this happened? I thought you were a God who loved me and that was for me. Who are you? And yet Jesus welcomed these questions and, and this statement. He didn't judge them. He didn't say, oh, you of little faith. He cried with them. He didn't think, yeah, he, he didn't think, oh, you have little faith. He felt for them. His presence was fully with them. His love for them was so evident that even the Jews said, see how he loved Lazarus. So to review, grieving is holy and sacred work that we cannot fast forward or skip over. It's to be welcomed. It needs to be taken seriously. It's not a single act or a one-time event. It's a process. Now, we need a ritual to help us release our emotions. And we need others to attend to our grief and emotionally be in it with us. And we see Jesus modeling it here in this passage about attending to these emotions. I am 100% for therapists, okay? You guys know this, we've talked about this. You know, we're, we just partnered with Watershed MPs. You guys got that email. I believe in the value of therapy. I also think it's not enough for our healing to just talk through emotions. We can't just talk through it. Words sometimes, it's just not enough. We need a faith village. We need a community to surround us, to be in it with us, to hold space for us, to be that safe healing circle for us. We need our heartbreaks to be validated, to be seen, to be nurtured, to be comforted, not in isolation, but in the presence of others and for others to grieve, cry, and weep with us in solidarity. Having this pod, this faith village, this container in place is crucial for our healing process. So why is it so important that we engage in this grief? If we disengage in our grief and loss, if I am not able to reflect on what I'm processing internally, if I'm not able to reflect on that, then I'm not going to be able to receive God's, self, God's compassion for me. I'm not going to be able to express that self-compassion. I will not have a good empathy meter to do this with others. And we will inadvertently project, blame, or transmit our pain onto others because we are in the pain. In 2012, my ama, my grandmother, passed away very suddenly. I grew up with her. She was like a second mother to me. She was sort of the heart of our family. 
and she loved to travel the world. And so it was, we were all in shock when we found out that she had passed away um, from an illness that she had caught during one of her travels. When she passed away, we all quickly flew back. Everyone flew back from all around the world. And that week was chaos. Everyone was trying to plan for the memorial service and get the papers together. And no one knew how to process this sudden loss. So what did I do? I avoided. I escaped. I thought, wow, uh, this, is, this is too hard. This is too chaotic. And I was working at the time with the ministry. It was the week before hiring week, and there were dozens of applications to read. So what did I do when I was in Taiwan, okay? This is the last time I was in Taiwan. I sat on my computer, and I read dozens and dozens of applications. No one on the regional leadership team ever reads through every application. But I did that. Because that's all I knew to do to cope with the pain and the grief and the loss that I was experiencing. That's how I dealt with grief. That's how I dealt with loss. So I went through the, the motions of the memorial service, everything, and flew back, and it was hiring week. And I told my supervisor, you've got to let me, you've got to let me be a part of this, because I, I read through all the applications. So I over-caffeinated myself, I had jet lag, over-caffeinated my, myself, and I went through hiring week. And for the whole year, guys, I saw, now I see, 2012, 2013, I had high-functioning depression. I was able to do things, get things done, but internally, I was a wreck. I was in so much pain. And I remember there's a, uh, we had a really hard time finding community out in Austin. This was in Austin. But there was a family that felt safe, okay? So my kids, their kids all got along super well. And the running joke was, whenever Grace comes over, she sleeps on the couch. <laughs> that was the running joke. And when I look back now, it's because I was depressed and here there's this safe space for me to just be and know my kids are okay. I don't have to worry about them. I could just be and I just fall asleep on the couch. That was the running joke. We visited recently and I still fell asleep on the couch. <laughs> it was just like this automatic thing, you know. But that year when I had depression, I also showed up in ways with the people around me that were not aligned with my values and principles. I, I oversaw, supervised a team of staff, and man, I micromanaged like crazy. I was controlling, because man, I was out of control on the inside, right? I couldn't attend to my children's emotions because I wasn't doing that myself. I had no compassion for myself, and I could not see or receive Christ's compassion for me or his grace for me. See, if we lack the ability, if we don't engage in our process and our grief, we will lack the ability to treasure and cherish what's right in front of us. Our empathy meter goes, it just gets thrown off. We show up in ways that we, that aren't, we show up in ways that don't reflect us as image bearers of Christ. And this is why owning our grief and engaging our grief work matters so very much. Our last section of this passage. 
verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. What's happening here? What's he doing here? before he raises Lazarus from the dead. Guys, there's hope and there's redemption on the other side. When we grieve everything in us wants resolution and closure. As Martha is grieving, she's, she's trying to make sense of this knowledge that she has about God's power and what Jesus says to her here in verse 25, look at verse 25. It's this foreshadowing of this process of grief. That there is painful, there's that painful aftermath of death. But there is hope. There is resurrection in the end and hope to live for. When Martha identifies Jesus as Messiah, the Son of God, in verse 27, she confesses this hope and restoration, a promised restoration for all things. When we grieve, we want that resolution. We want that closure. And in the end, there may not be resolution and closure in the way that we think we need. But God grants us the ability through the spirit that lives in us to be whole and to be fully alive again. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So the paramount question in this story that Jesus asked Mar Martha is, do you believe this? Do you trust this to be true? The focus here is not on the person, Lazarus, who is dead, but it's on those who are living. How will we continue to live in this new reality as we experience grief and loss? Jesus wasn't trying to test Martha, but to help her see that he will raise us up from the death of grief, that he will rescue us when we feel like we are in the pit of death and despair. But can we still trust in God and have confidence in him and have this enduring hope that Christ's presence will come and enter into the painful and broken parts of our heart? It feels like death. But Christ has overcome Christ has come, and he will breathe new life into us even when we feel like we are numb, even when we feel like we are dead inside. This is the good news and enduring hope of the gospel, friends. As friends and family engage in grief, one of the hardest things to hear is, you'll be a stronger and better person after all of this. <sighs> What's our natural response to that? I don't, I don't want to be stronger. I don't feel very strong at all right now. I, I never asked for this. What's helpful to hear and so incredibly powerful and empowering is for a friend to say, you are a different person than you were six months ago. You're a different person than you were a year ago. You, I see that you are stronger. 
I see a different person in front of me. But we can only say this if we walk with people in their grief, right? We can only see that growth that comes when a person reaches this new level of optimal. This is what we call post-traumatic growth, where our capacity expands and we become people that we never could have become had we not gone through what we went through and engaged in the process of grief towards healing. Here are a couple of ways of looking at it. Kintsuki is this ancient art form in Japanese art where they're, they're broken pieces of pottery, but they put it back together with gold and it becomes so much more beautiful than it was before. This damage is viewed as part of this history Some, instead of something that is to be disguised or hide or thrown away. This process of repairing this, this thing is, this bowl or cup or teapot is just so much more beautiful than it was before. Here's another way of looking at it. Dr. Lois Tonkin, a grief researcher, describes grief in this way after numerous interviews with the bereaved. Our grief, it doesn't shrink over time as we process it, but we learn to live with it with acceptance that this is actually a, a part of our lives now. But we grow around it. We can still make new memories and meet new people, go, new, go to new places and discover new adventures. Our lives expand around this grief. But we don't pretend that it no longer exists or that we've moved on from it. Some practical takeaways. How do we begin this process? We want to slow down. Okay, you got to slow down. It allows us to breathe in deeply, connect with our bodies, connect with our hearts, with our mind, with our souls, what's happening internally. Pay attention. Own that grief when it comes. Get curious about what it feels like to move through. I had a moment last year, a couple years ago, I was just driving, going to Chesco, getting ready to make a new dish. I was so excited, Chinese dish, I was so excited. And on the way there, a memory of my grandmother popped up in my mind, okay? And I paid attention to it. And the tears began to flow. Pulled into the Chesco parking lot, and I sat there, and I, I knew who I was. It's been, it's been over 10 years, but I'm still grieving, okay? Had the tears flow. And in that moment, I remembered a needle plate that gra my grandmother made for me. Because I played piano, played violin growing up. And she made this for me. And I was like, where is this? I don't have this. I don't have anything from my grandmother. Where is this? So I call my mom from the Jesco parking lot. I said, Mom, where is this? Do you know where it is? I will have it shipped to my house. I need to know where it is. And she's like, oh, it's just sitting in my, in my closet. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. I go from Jesco straight to my mom's house. I pick it up. And now it's sitting next to my bed. It's hanging next to my bed. And every morning I see it. I know my grandmother loved me. It was very treasure that I discovered this. And so important to my healing. But I would not have remembered this needlepoint that had been uh, in my mom's closet had I not paid attention. Slow down. It means we need a clear out our Google calendars or whatever schedule that you have with activities and work, whatever it is, slow down. 
and pay attention. We also want to just slow down those racing thoughts, guys. And that comes with journaling and welcoming your grief with kindness and compassion. This is your chance to own the grief as yours, not hide it or run away from it or stuff it. Welcome it. Our wounds are worthy of our care, and this is one way to care and be attuned to your mind, your body, and your heart. Find something that you can see, touch, or hold that can serve as a metaphor of your grief. It can be a photograph, a favorite place, a place where you felt that sorrow so you can go back into that place, a piece of art that you create, whatever it is, it is symbolic of your grief and that it's something you can hold on to. So that new meaning and a new story can emerge from this symbol. And lastly, process with safe and trustworthy people. We cannot heal on our own. We cannot privately heal through prayer. We cannot privately heal through reading scripture. We need to be seen by human beings, validated, comforted, and held by people who care for us. Adam Young, a counselor and podcaster, he says in his podcast, The Place We Find Ourselves, he says this, when we become the container for ourselves, we cannot move into the process of grief because we end up recycling the grief and move it into our bodies. We need to recover our right to ask for help in grief or it will recycle perpetually. We're going to spend five minutes doing this. I think it's real important because we don't do this enough. We haven't had much practice doing this. But I want to encourage you, as Jessica comes up, I want to encourage you to turn around and talk with a couple of people around you. And we're going to talk about grief. We don't talk about grief enough, okay? So this is, this is a little unusual for us. We haven't done this in a long time. I want us to do this. Is the idea of grief work, is it foreign to you? Just pick one of these questions to answer. This is a lot, okay? Have you observed your grief in the past? How have you done this? What were you taught about grieving and mourning in your family of origin? What's something from the message or John 11 that you're sitting with? What's one tool you'd like to use in your engagement? So Jessica's playing this music so you can get a little more, it's a little less awkward, but I just, just want you guys to talk about this because we just don't practice this enough. So just do one person if you'd like, turn around, do two people. This isn't just a private or individual thing, okay? So I'm gonna give you a few minutes to do that and then we're gonna say our sibling.
hope you will continue these conversations. We've got this fellowship group here, so it's great you guys can talk about it. Let's keep these conversations alive. Let's not be afraid to own and name our grief and talk about what grief processing looks like because, man, it's, it's not just the funeral. It's not just when someone passes away. There are so many kinds of grief that we all bear. And we need each other. We need each other. We need to be that container, that, that healing circle, that pod for one another, that faith bridge. Yeah. Will you stand as we say our sending prayer? Loving God through all our years, let the church be a community where we learn about love and practice it, where we envision peace and work to build it, where we meet partners in faith who wish to abandon everything that cheapens our discipleship, where we discover gifts and offer them. May your spirit guide us toward joy and generosity. In Jesus' name, in the way of Jesus. Chrissy and I will be here up front. If you would like prayer, if you'd like a holding space, a safe space to process, receive prayer. Uh, for the rest of y'all, we'll see you next week.